بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له هو يتولى الصالحين وأشهد أن محمد عبده رسول أرسله الله بالحق أرسله الله رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Thank you all for attending again. This is our sixth installment on building a legacy through positive parent-child relation. Is parent-child relation one-way street or two-way street? One-way street or two-way street? Two-way street. Why is it a two-way street? Tell me why parenting, child-parent-child relationship is a two-way street. So you know two-way street means cars go both ways. One-way street means cars go, cars go one way. So why is it a two-way street? How? To explain to me, to convince me. Two-way street. Yes, yes, yes. You want to tell me why? You give me, I mean, you give, you give him everything and he gives you back. You know? Abu Ismail said you give him everything, he gives you back. And he, she gives you back. Okay. For yourself, you give, give some back. Now, you give, they give. So giving. Yes. How else? Interaction between parent and child. It's an interaction, he says, between parent and child. Two way street. Yes, sir. Love. They go back and forth. The parent loves the child and the child loves the parent. Good job. Parent loves child, child loves parent. Right? So it's a two way street. It's not one way. It's not that I'm just going to be an awesome parent and then that's it. It stops. Right? It's not that I'm going to be an obedient child that listens and then that's it. No. There has to be parent-child relation. That's why it's a relationship. It's two-way. Some parenting needs to happen. And being a good, a good obedient child must happen as well. Today we're going to go over some myths about parenting. Myths. Things that people think or thought about parenting that actually aren't true. We're going to debunk them as they say. You're going to prove that they are myths and indeed we're going to discuss them. Remember, this discussion here with, with you and I, this is not a one-way street either. It's not just from me to you. This is a two-way street. I want your input. Your input is just as important to me than the material that we prepare. So remember, your input is key. How you feel is key. What you think is key. Your experience is key. All of that is key. Uh, Yasin, do me a favor. Come sit next to Brother Aziz right here. Right, right. Please. Thank you very much, please. Right, right in front of me. Come, come. If you get up and come here, you'll see. Hey, right. Shakallahu lak. Shakallahu lak. Babakallah. Jazakallahu. Kullah khair. Right there. I mean, right there. I said. So we said we're going to debunk some myths. What is a myth? Tell me what a myth is. Tell me what a myth is. Yes, Rubeida. Sing. Something that doesn't exist. Something that doesn't exist. Yes. Um, like a fairy tale, like um, a fairy tale that passes on from generation that doesn't that doesn't really exist. It's like a story. Yes. So the point of what you said is that it's a false. It doesn't exist. It's a false idea, false belief. There are some myths about parenting. We're going to discuss them and yani get rid of them. But before that, we're going to discuss, use some ayahs from the Qur'an about parenting, about the relationship between father and son as we usually do. And in this case, we're talking about Yusuf, Surat Yusuf. Now, how many of you here have read Surat Yusuf before? Okay. How many of you read Surah Yusuf in English? I mean, if you understand English, how many of you read it in English? Well, I haven't read it in English, but I know the whole Surah Almost talking about Yusuf. Good job. So you know the surah is talking about Yusuf. Have you memorized the surah or you just know about the surah? I know about the surah. What about yourself, Allah? Yeah, I read it. You read the whole thing in English or in Arabic? English. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. English and Arabic. Like how many people read it in English and Arabic? You understand it in English and you read it in Arabic too. Alhamdulillah, our brother did. Some of you did. Read the surah. Alhamdulillah. Read the surah. If you've ever read any book before, any novel, any chapter book, Allah's book is more deserving that we pay attention to and we give some time. Remember, even if you just read one surah, that's good. You benefit something out of it. Meaning you read the Arabic, you read the meaning. Even if you were to read surah, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٌ If you memorize the meaning of that surah, 
you are upon a lot of khayr. You have a lot of khayr is inheld in that surah. In fact, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that this that surah is equal to a third of the Qur'an. It's equal to what? A third of the Qur'an because of what it contains. It clarifies who Allah is, how He is, and then it tells you what He isn't so that you understand Him. And that's what a third of the Qur'an discusses anyway. So even if you know the meaning of that, if you know the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillah, Khair wa Barakah, it's a benefit for you. And of course, again, don't let any surah go by you that you've read the Arabic to, that you don't read the English. Read it along with it, alhamdulillah. Surah Yusuf. Now, the whole of Surah Yusuf is mostly about family and how things can go wrong in a family. But I'm going to just take the first few ayats. I'm going to go over them briefly. Yusuf had a dream. Didn't he? Yusuf yeah. had a dream. Yeah. He saw the sun and the moon prostrating to him. And he saw 11 stars prostrating to him. He told his father. Why did he tell his father? Yes, sir. Because um, he, he, he might have been a prophet. Of course, because his father Yaqub was a prophet at the time. Why else? Good job. If you have a concern, talk to your parents about it. What do you think, Safalah? To understand the meaning of his of course, he goes to his father so that his father can give him understanding. That means fathers and mothers are sources of knowledge. Should be, right? They give you clarity on things. Alhamdulillah. Tayyip, go to him and feel comfortable to speak to your father. If you as a father have not made your child comfortable enough to come to you to speak to you about things, then you are losing the war. Not between you and your child, between you and Satan. Between you and your child and Satan. Because you and your child are on the same team against Satan. And if your child is not comfortable with speaking to you, you are losing the war. Think about that. Always need a door of communication, especially in the West. Now you might say to me, you know, Imam, you always talk about, especially in the West, especially in the West and so forth. It's really important. Because whatever would have gone okay, however you respected your father, and mother, back home, most likely your kids won't get even a tenth of that. So you have to replace it with what is equivalent to it. What's equivalent to it on this side of the globe is communication. See, back home you had a whole neighborhood of aunts and uncles and cousins and grandmoms. They instill respect that the whole village raised the child. And then many of you are much more mature because you didn't have a lot of luxury. You didn't have microwaves and most of your TVs and all of these things, you, you, you just, you know, you put your bread inside of a tin note, you know, a, a, a clay oven maybe. You had very little stuff. You played with a, a tire and a stick and you were chasing down the street. That's how you had fun. We just do like this. So the reality is that you might have, may have not even gone to your father for many things. You had so much respect for him that you didn't even look at him in the face. That was excellent for the, that area. But here you have to communicate to your children. You have to. Communication is key. So make your children feel comfortable that they can talk to you about anything. Now the only way they're going to do that is if they know that they're not going to be judged. If they know, think you're going to judge them as soon as they say two things out of line, two words out of line, this and that, and you're going to say, oh, be quiet, I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't. Then they're never going to talk to you. See, Yusuf was comfortable with talking about this to his father, and he could trust his father that his father wouldn't judge him. He didn't talk to it about his. He didn't talk about this with his brothers. He talked to it about. He talked about this issue with his father. Remember that. That's the first lesson. Like, then, his father said to him, "My dear son, do not tell this story to your brothers, because they will plot against you." This is a, this is we're going to get into this concept of. People think that because you're good parents, you're going to automatically raise good ch children, like, you know, uh, cookie cutter. Because you're righteous and you pray, salah, and you do this and do that and fast Allah, and you read a lot of Quran, that doesn't mean that your children are going to do the same thing. And just because a person is a fajr, a person is a disobedient, wicked person, a person can be a disbeliever, but righteous children can come from that individual. In fact, many of the Sahaba had parents that were mushriki, that died in Badr that were on the opposing army, and that were slain in Badr, right? And many of them, they didn't mean, يعني, basically as Allah said, يُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ وَيُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ Allah takes the alive, things that are alive from dead. The disbelievers in this case are dead. 
and he takes alive children like Khalid ibn al-Walid. Of course, he did not believe initially, but he believed after. And Walid ibn al-Mughira, Allah threatened him in the Quran, he's going to be in the hellfire, right? So, and he said, وَيُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ Sometimes you have a believing parents, but the children come out as if dead, meaning they disbelieve. Like that uh, boy that was killed by Khidr in Surah Kahf. Allah said that his parents were righteous parents. His parents were righteous parents. And Allah didn't want his this boy to tire his parents out with oppression and disbelief. You see? So we're going to discuss that in, in, in detail. But Yaqub knew his children. He knows. That's another thing. Parents, fathers, moms. Please, know, you know your kids. But Yani, know your kids. Get to know your kids. Spend time with them. You know, talk to him, then have a conversation without it getting weird. If it feels weird, that means you're not talking enough to your kids. I'm telling you, it takes a lot of work. Talk to your children, because he said, do not tell your brothers because they will plot against you. Because Satan is an evident enemy to the human being. Yes, sir. Right. Now, Yaqub, he asked, you know, how relevant is it to tell your brother, tell them, tell your son that your brothers may plot against you? Allah knows. If you look at it diligently, you see that Yaqub knew that his children were jealous of Joseph. And he mentioned in the ayat that Allah will choose you to be a prophet and complete his favor upon you. And teach you the interpretation of the dream. He knew this. So he knows that your brothers, they won't be chosen like you. You're already special, chosen by Allah. And they recognize that. They know that it's something special about you and they can't stand it. So he said, be careful. They will plot against you if you tell them. You see? He's preparing the child. That's another thing. There's a, a such thing as an age yelling where the child is mature enough to take some, some, some information that will protect them. You keep treating them like babies until they're 18 years old. They'll be babies for a longer time even after that. Right? So there's, uh, you know, you have to, you're intelligent. Don't forget, you all are intelligent individuals. So you can use that sense and make dua and, you know, teach, take the teaching from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and apply it. Of course, you will be able to do an excellent job as long as you try your hardest. So then, Allah said that there is a sign in Joseph and his brothers for those who ask. Remember, Allah told, gave this surah to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam after Am al huzn after the year of sorrow, when his father, excuse me, his uncle, who was who was who died, his uncle that died. Who was his uncle that died? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's uncle. Now nah? he died. Yes. Abu Talib. Abu Talib, his uncle died, Abu Talib, and his wife, which wife of his died? Khadija, in the same year, that was a difficult time for him. Allah revealed to him Surah Yusuf to remind him and give him the good tidings that just as Joseph's brothers plotted against him, Quraysh are going to plot against you. And just as Joseph's brothers tried to kill him, Quraysh are trying to, get, going to try to kill you. And just as Allah saved Joseph from his brothers, Allah will save you from Quraysh. And just as Allah gave preference and superiority to Joseph at the end of the story, Allah will give you superiority over Quraysh at the end of the story. So giving him that comfort, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But in that, you find that their brother said, they said to themselves, Joseph and his brother Benjamin, Benjamin, are more beloved to your father than you all, and we are a clan. We're strong. You know, we're a couple folks. Then they said, "Our father is clearly stupid. Yeah, I mean, he's an idiot, right?" We say it in you know in, in plain error, but nobody speaks like that. Honestly, kids, if they were going to speak behind your back, they call you what? Stupid. So he's dumb. He doesn't understand anything. Obviously, because he chooses those guys over us, we're, we're better than them. And that's the arrogance, right? That means you can have arrogance in your house and you don't even notice. Right? Even if you're not arrogant, but your children can be. So then, they said, kill Leo Joseph. Or at least, 
toss him off to some far off land. يَخْلُوا لَكُمْ وَجْهُ أَبِيكُمْ So that the, the face of your father will be يعني, designated for you. They want their father's attention so bad that they're willing and dedicated to either kill their brother or ship him away. Could you imagine your child ship your other child away somewhere? You can't imagine it. Imagine, big sister, big brother, ships the little brother, little sister away somewhere. Guys, don't get any ideas, okay? Please, don't get any ideas. Huh? And it's not, it's not a good story, right? So, in the regards that it wasn't a good job that what they did. It is a good story overall, but it wasn't a good job what they did. Yes? So, when the brothers um, threw Yusuf down a well, and then they took fake blood and like put it on a shirt, and then said a wolf ate them, how did the brothers, um, they, how did they find out? I'm going to tell you in a second. Right, I'm going to tell you right now. Yes, that's the story. So I'm going to, I'm going to just summarize this story for you guys because this is just an example of family in the Quran. So then one of them said, don't kill Joseph, but throw him into the bottom of a well. Some travelers will pick him up if you really want to do something about him. He was you know, the most reasonable of them. Don't kill him. Just put him in a well. Some people go on the Bible, pick him up. And if you want to really do something about him, do that. But he still shared with them in the sin because he went along with it. He was the most sound of them. He was the, the best of them, right? That he kept them from killing Joseph, which is excellent. But he still was wrong because he uh, assisted them. So then they went to their father and they lied to their father. They deceived their father. Our father, why don't you trust us with Joseph? Who are they putting the blame on? No, they're putting the blame on their father. These are, I mean, teenage Boys and elder, you don't trust us with Joseph. Guilt tripping their father. You know, guilt tripping their father. Trying to make their father feel guilty to make him give in to something. This means the prophet's children can do this to him. Then what about your children? That's what I'm saying. You gotta be at least prepared. That's why the stories are there. That's why it's all there, so we can benefit from it. So then they said, You you are you don't trust us. Why don't you trust us with Joseph? We are sincere counselors to him. We are well wishers. We don't want nothing but good for this guy. Right? They're lying. They're lying to their father. Is it halal to lie? Is it allowed to lie? No. Absolutely not. Right? He's not allowed to lie. No. Nobody should lie, right? And lying to someone is not like lying to your parents. Lying to your parents is even worse. Even though you think you're going to get away with it. You know what? Our parents used to tell us that if you lie, you got to follow that lie with another lie to cover the tracks. You got to follow that lie with another lie. Eventually, you're going to get caught in one of those lies and all of those lies are going to crumble down. So you might as well be truthful from the beginning, right? Don't tell any lies, okay? Especially to your parents, okay? No lies, thank you. So then... He said, oh, they said, send him with us tomorrow. We can eat and have fun. We are going to really guard him. We're going to watch him well. Then the father said, I am saddened that you take him. It saddens me that you take him away. And I'm afraid that some wolf will eat him while you all are not paying attention. You know how your kids are playing sometimes and they're not really paying paying attention to the youngsters because they don't want the youngsters to come with them or they don't want to be have to be babysitting. That's natural. That natural feeling was there. And he said, I'm afraid that you won't be aware of him and he will be eaten by a wolf. But they said, if a wolf eats him while we are a strong clan of boys, then we are losers. They say we're worthless. If we can't defend him from a wolf, then it's no good in us. The whole time they're playing along with the story. Look how deceitful they were. Of course, they went out and when they were playing, they put him in the bottom of the well after that. And they came to their father crying. They're crying, fake crying now. They went from deceit and lying to fake crying. They're putting on a show. Oh, you know, our, you know, we left Joseph near some of our things and a wolf came and eat, ate him and so forth. And they brought a shirt stained with fake blood. But guess what? Some of the professors want to say that the blood, the shirt wasn't even ripped. The shirt wasn't even 
rip. Most likely, if you get attacked by a dog or a wolf or something, and it eats you, yani the wolf ate him. That's the whole of it. If they came back with the shirts, that means none of his body remains. Right? Otherwise, to prove their point, they could have come back with some limbs or something. You know, it would have been, of course, gross. But, you know, they would have prayed Janazah over it or something. Right? The limbs. But they just came with a shirt stained with fake blood. It wasn't even torn up. So the father knew the whole time. The father knew that the children were lying. The father knew that the children were lying. That's another lesson in parenting. That you see that Yaqub is, we, we, we say, playing along with it. And he's doing for a long time. And he is so patient and kind to his children that he's letting them live a lie. And pretend that their brother was was eaten by a wolf, and he preferred to be patient with his children. Now, I mean, we talk about our kids and how messed up they are, and how they don't pray, and how they are so disrespectful. Yes, indeed, for the most part, we do find this stuff. But look at Yaqub's patience with his kids. Now, I'm not saying you all are not patient, but that's a lot of patience. You're talking about three decades, maybe thirty years plus. Of living the lie, yani, going along with this lie. That is extremely, yani, that, that is hard, even for me to think about it. Not even for me as if that means something. But point is, like, even when I think about it, it it's like, wow, I can't even imagine it. Allah. So Yaqub was a very chosen servant of Allah. Yes. When you said that this shirt wasn't even rubbed. Yes. Um, does it mean that I'm talking about can me or anyone could identify? If this purse, if this shirt is ripped in this dunya? Yeah, of course. Remember, remember, if a person gets attacked by a dog or a wolf, <laughs> yani, if it eats you, it's going to rip something. They just bought a shirt. But, yeah, but you said it's not actually. It wasn't ripped. ripped. So the point is, my point is, they, they're, they're prop. This is called a prop, right? You know, when you're having a play or something, you have a prop, like a plate or a stove, it's called props. This prop, was, they didn't even do it well. Their lie wasn't a good lie. It wasn't very convincing. right? And they brought a shirt that wasn't even ripped. So his father, their father could see automatically that these children are lying. And he said, He said, Your souls have made this matter beautiful to you. So he's basically saying, it's You guys... The reality is you all are messed up. You all are messed up, but he's saying it in such a polite way. That your souls have made this look very cool to you. فَصَبُرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ مُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ He said patience, sabrun jameel, a beautiful patience. And Allah's help is sought from what you all falsify. You're lying. You're making up things. But Allah's help is sought. I and mean, this man, Ya'qub alayhi salam, was a beautiful man, beautiful prophet, that he was so patient with his kids, that alhamdulillah, we can at least maybe take, maybe if we take 1% of that, I think that's reasonable, right? <laughs> Even Because if I say 10%, that's a lot. 10% of that is a lot. I would say 1% of that, you know, if we can work on a half a percent of that with patience with our kids, we might do well. Yes, sir. Um, I thought they killed the sheep and then they got the blood from the sheep. It could have been. Allah said, Demin kadib, yani false blood. It wasn't Joseph's blood. It could have been sheep blood. It could have been any uh, blood. Whatever the Mufassirun, uh, of course, they probably have different conclusions in that regard. I did not look into that detail. So I don't know the detail. So let's continue. That, of course, now Allah went back to the story of the part where they sold him because they sold him before they went back crying to their father. <coughs> When somebody picked him, him up from the well, they said, Hada gulam, this is a young boy. Well, means that they basically hid him in their luggage. Meaning the of people purchased it. And they, their brothers, sold him for a very small price. If you sell something for a very small price, then what does that mean? It doesn't have value to you, right? What else? I mean, you want to get rid of it, right? That's how they did. They sold him for pennies, as we say. 
That's how bad it was. They just wanted to get rid of their brother. Think about that. If that happens in, to, in the prophet's house, then definitely you'll have similar sicknesses in yourself and in your children in your home. Especially with mass media pumping the stuff into your brain and your soul and your heart almost 24-7. These malices, these sicknesses are in you. You and I have to realize that these sicknesses are in us and try ourselves to purge them meaning to cleanse them out. If your brothers do something to you or your sister does something to you that you don't like, don't do the same thing to them. Meaning, don't do the thing that they, doesn't, that they don't like. Do something that they do like. Maybe they'll stop being mean to you. Maybe they'll be nice. Maybe they'll be kinder, right? You have to be careful. Even if your sibling is being a bad sibling, you should, you should be the good sibling. And try your best. And guess what? If nothing else works, guys, you can always make dua. Ask Allah to help you and ask Allah to guide your brother and sister. Say, oh Allah guide. Allah is he's up there. He is listening and he wants to he wants to listen to you. So make dua and say, Oh Allah, I'm having a problem with my sister. I'm having a problem with my brother. Please fix us all. Make us clean. Make us do the right things. Make us say the right things, right? Get used to dua. Parents, please Allah, teach you. Yes, Habib. Say the brothers sold the brother Yes. The brothers put him on a well and the caravan came and picked him up. Yes. So the brother so, had to so No, the they sold him. So what happened is when the caravan picked him up, they came to meet the caravan and and made it seem like he was a slave. You see, that's how well they planned it. I mean they came from a distance, they saw him speak, they were waiting for him to be picked up. So when he was picked up, they said, hey, this is our slave. We'll sell him to you right now. You see, and what they did was they, they wanted a caravan to take him so that they take him far away. That was a plan. But okay, the scholar David, there is two debates in that story. Of course, debate that's one, one, the one you said about uh -huh. and another debate say, what's wrong with the ten and you bought him? The Rahi Namah is dead. What can we even say? Which is mean, what's wrong which means Al Aziz. He, yeah, they purchased he, him. He, he him you know. Yeah, I mean, and in the beginning, you know, uh, I was saying uh, Yahoo, he was loved those two kids, Yusuf and his brother, yeah. but their, their mother died early, you know. She right, kept these the are the second one no. to clear by for the, the kids, you know. No. So he was loving, but he can keep the love away from the other kids, you know. No. That's why the jealousy is a few in this story from the beginning, you know. <laughs> And when they go and they drop him and come with the shirts, you know, with the blood, there's no tear, there's no nothing. How the, how the, the wolf is, is jump on him and he doesn't have nothing in his shirt. You know, exactly. Just they kill small lambs, you know, and put the, the blood in it, you know, and they come with the shirts. Right. Of course, that's, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the story, you know, one by, step by step, you know, to, to, to make him, you know, clear they been cooking some big liar, you know. That's what it is. Right. Yes. And of course all of these details are available to you if you pick up many tafasir that are in any language that you prefer. The English you have them available. It gives you these differences and some of these details. I'm just going over briefly to let us see that you have these types of problems in the household of a prophet. So these pro the I mean, these problems being in your household and my household is not something that's like you know amazing. It's not something that is not expected. No, we must kind of prepare ourselves, and that's why the Quran is there for us as a guidance. When we say "Ihdina sirat al mustaqim," guide us to the straight path, and Allah said that al kitab al arayba fi huda nil mustaqim that that is the book. There is no doubt about it. There is no doubt within it. It is a guidance for those who are disciplined, right? When Allah said that this book is a guidance, that means you have to, and I have to, keep going back to it to have it solve our problems. If you keep going through problems, and I keep going through problems, and you keep going through life, and I keep going through life, but we keep not going to the Qur'an, then we're going to continue with our problems, and they're going to lead to bigger problems and bigger headaches, and we're going to be messed up. We're going to be stressed out. If things are not working, all we got to do is go take the prescription, like the doctor. When you get sick, what happened? What's happened when you get sick? They take you to the doctor. They take you to the doctor. And what is the no man? Tell me what the doctor gives you. 
Your wife medicine. says medicine. medicine. What is it called before he gives you medicine? Prescription. prescription. You take the prescription, you go pick up the medicine. Yeah, if you're sick, Ukhti, if you're sick and you don't go pick up the medicine, the doctor wrote you the prescription. If you don't pick up the medicine, whose fault is it? The doctor's fault? Your fault? Your fault. Your fault. Same thing. The, no, it's not. And then you take the Quran al Azim. That you take the Quran al Azim, it's a prescription for you and me. If we don't take the prescription, we're going to have the sicknesses and we're going to destroy and destroy and destroy and lose. At the end of the day, Allah is perfect. Allah is great. He doesn't need us. He will be Him great and perfect and awesome and we're going to see that on the Day of Judgment. But if we don't use His prescription, we lose. Right? They say if you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't use it, you lose it. May Allah help us all. Let's get to it. Now, myths on parenting. We want to, alhamdulillah, spend a very short time with this today. We have about 40 minutes. Leave some time for questions and answers, inshallah. The first myth on parenting are inherited parenting methods. Inherited parenting methods means you take something of parenting that you got from your parents, that they got from their parents, that they got from their parents. The, most likely, you cannot raise your children based off only how your parents raised you. You cannot. Because where they raised you, the time they raised you, and the distractions of your time are far different than where you are today. Remember, we need to tailor make our approach to survival or living in the West. Tailor make. Because we have different circumstances here. Yes, yeah, somebody may argue that these circumstances are spreading worldwide and it's becoming a worldwide phenomenon. That's correct because of media and so forth. But I believe, honestly, because I lived overseas in the East, I've seen that there are things built and instilled in the culture that still protect the kids. There are multiple things that are built there. Yes, it's diminishing and it's dying away. I agree, to a great extent it is. But still, the point is, in all of those cultures, there are something, things that are there that are protecting the society in different ways. What we don't have here, alhamdulillah. But we ask that Allah make it easy for us. So, inheritance ways, where however you raise... You were raised by your parents, not necessarily it's not going to work for your kids. Maybe some of it, but definitely uh, believing that all of it will work is not the case. For, so for, in order for me to explain that well, we have to differentiate between culture, cultural Islam, and Islamic culture. Now, I don't know if you heard this before, but I'm going to ask you, what is culture itself? Define culture. Let me see if we get some big guys. Some uh, hairy brothers. Yeah. Some elders, yeah, I mean, not hairy brothers. Some people who have some years, a couple decades under their belts. Tell me, define me what you think culture is. Culture, culture, culture. Culture. The shared values between a group of people that norms their traditions. Norms, traditions, values, shared. Very within important. A geographical area within a certain group of people. Exactly. Culture. Go ahead. Local community rules. Local community rules. Play up sisters. Please. Same, similar thing. Share the values of a particular geographical location, a group of people. Culture is basically, as you said, those basic things, or the or I should say the Geographical spin on the basic forms or molds of life. I don't know if that makes any sense, but basically how the ge geography has an effect. When I say geography, I mean the people that are there. How that has an effect and how that differs with the basic necessities of life. Basic necessities of life are eating, drinking, sleeping, having kids, getting married, having kids. Um, dealing with parents, dealing with neighbors. Everybody does that. Everybody gets married. Everybody has children. Everybody deals with neighbors and parents. Everybody goes to work. But how a particular group of people do those things is called culture. That's why it's different. Because some people go to work different, different times of the day. Some people get married with different cultural things, even in the Muslim world. Egyptians and Saudis and indo and everybody get married in a little, little different way. Certain things that you have, you know, Africans. And of 
course, uh, in America, it's kind of mixed of everybody, but in those dominant places, there are different ways to eat. Some people sit on the floor. Some people only eat with their hands. Some people eat with utensils. You know, some people don't eat certain foods with certain things. You maybe don't, you drink before eating or drink after eating. These are cultural things. That's, so we understand what culture is. Basically, your particular, your people's take on the basic necessities of life. That's what culture is, it's basic meaning of it. Now, what is cultural Islam? They I want you to pay attention. Very close. Cultural Islam. I don't think you've heard of this before, but that's why I'm telling it to you, because I want to inform you of this importance. Yes, sir. No. <laughs> it is uh, basically Islam affected by your culture. Good, that's a better one. Yes, ma'am. Good. So, culture, where culture meets religion. Where culture meets religion where your culture has an effect on your practice of Islam and then that is depicted to people in a certain way people see that as Islam for example if you have certain parts of the world where women cannot talk to men at all right that and people see that that's Islam but what well, actually that's actually geographical the people who, the place or part of the world where the women don't talk to men at all and the men don't talk to women at all, then that's a particular place. Right? That's cultural Islam. If the woman, uh, you know, is, is treated a certain way, mistreated a certain way, particular parts of the world, people see that as Islam, but it's not. It's actually the culture of those people that they treat the women that way. It's not across the board that all Muslims do that. Okay. If you have many different. Uh, Naam Habib. Hijab may be a good example in terms of how it's dressed the sisters with the hijab, for right. example, in Pakistan or maybe in Yemen or maybe in Morocco. This may be different the dress. Right. It's hijab, but still the dress is different. It's different. Culturally, it's what, uh, really culturally. That. Yeah, exactly. So the culture determines that. Yes, sir. I guess I have to write it up because some of some part of Africa and Spain comes in and comes back to Omen. It's completely not. Well, actually, it is, but let me explain that. So, some people have uh, the way they have uh, circumcision for women is mutilation. Uh, these are big words, but basically, uh, there are t ancient practices before Islam where they destroy the, the girl. Whereas in Islam, it's allowed to circumcise, but there's far less than that. You don't destroy the girl, it, it's allowed to do that uh, at a very limit, just as it's allowed to do for the men at a limit. You know what I mean? So yes, these are cultural things that people take that that's Islam, but it's not Islam. And so forth, many different things. And a lot of the times when people are complaining about Muslims and Islam, it's because of some prevalent culture somewhere that majority Muslims practice, but it has nothing to do with Islam. Like honor killings. You heard of that before? If the girl makes a mistake, or a boy makes a mistake, so he killed them. Like a sexual mistake, I and mean, he goes out to have a date, something like that. So to, to, to protect your honor, you kill it. So people think, you know, people, they look at Islam and say, they talk about honor killings and forced marriages. Are you kidding me? Forced marriage? I mean, they say you got married and you, your parents forced you to do it. No, that wasn't the case. All of you would agree that if even if your parents found your partner, you are pleased with that. Your parents didn't force you. No, you have to marry her. You get what I'm saying? It may be cases where that is the case. But that's not, that's a, these are cultures. People did that, but that doesn't reflect, reflect Islam. That's cultural Islam. Where the culture looks like Islam, but it may not have anything to do with Islam. I want you guys to do some more research on that, to get a clearer picture on that, because that's another point that this takes, that, this topic that I'm speaking about takes a whole series of lectures to debunk or go through, sift through, but we'll do that inshallah at a later time. However, Islamic culture is the opposite. Where Islam determines the culture. Islam determines the culture. And whatever is allowed in Islam 
is affecting the culture and whatever Islam does not allow, the, the culture never accepts it. Right? That's a different and in fact if we when we go back to practicing Islamic culture, we'll have a lot a lot less backlash from people and a lot less misunderstanding. Right? Because Islam doesn't allow abuse to win women or men or children. But when we do it, people say Muslims do. No, they don't. Muslims are not supposed to do that. Right? And so forth. So when we go back to practicing Islamic culture, which is developed, of course, by the pillars of Islam, five pillars of Islam, the six articles of faith, right? These things determine our practice as Muslims. So when, inshallah, when we go back to that and, and, and practice that, we'll be able to understand that not everything in our culture including our parenting that we got from our culture is correct. We have to compare it to Islam itself. And if it passes the test, then we practice it. If it doesn't, we abandon it. Basically, that's basically all of that talk was just for that conclusion. Whatever Islam says goes. And whatever our culture does not fit with Islam, we reject it, even though it's our culture. Even though our fathers and mothers practice it, including parenting, if they did it and it's wrong, you're not gonna do it. You don't have to you know, hate your parents for it, you love them. And of course, you make du'a for them. But the point is, at the end of the day, we have to compare what is true to what's falsehood. And we all have the ability to do so. Yes, but it's mine. Yeah, because there is ahkam. If you, if, if you don't follow the ahkam, you know, in the sharia, you're not going to do it right. Right. So we have to be able to be conscious of our deen, right? And follow the deen as appropriately as possible. That's all. That's basically what it is. Follow the deen appropriately, even if it means you're going to have to abandon some of the things of your culture that are wrong. It's okay. I don't mind I mean, I've come from Western culture, right? And anything that doesn't agree with Islam and my culture, I don't, I'm not supposed to practice it. Yes, of course, we are newer, and you all are, I mean, America is, what, 200 years old? Yeah, we're newer. We have some problems in our culture. We don't, we, you know, we don't practice it, or we should not practice it in Islam. But you all are much elder than that. You have hundreds of years. Hundreds. Some of you, I mean, 600 years, 700 years, 800 years, Islam has been in your area. So it, it, it takes work, but we, we have to be willing to give it up. If it is harmful to us and it's not Islamic, then abandon it. You know, these extravagant weddings that we have, uh, forcing the children to wait so long before they get married and all of the stipulations that we put, oh, you got to have this much money and that much career and all this. Stuff. We're making it hard for people to get married. These are just examples that now we've carried our culture over and it's, it's not working. Yes, it probably worked over there or somewhere, but it's not working here. So we have to get with the program. My point of all of that is even in parenting, we have to sift. Sift it out like flour. Right? Sift it out so that the pure flour can come out. That was a long discussion just to prove that point. But I hope it put up, turned on some light bulbs for you. We put some things that work in your heart and in your minds. Another issue of parenting is monkey see, monkey do. That's a statement. Monkey see, monkey do, meaning whatever monkey sees, he will do. Yani whatever you see someone doing in parenting may not apply to your children. That's called cookie cutter parenting. You know cookie cutter? Every time you put the cookie cutter on there, it's going to cut the cookie out the same way, right? Like gingerbread man, right? Gingerbread man cookies, you put the gingerbread man on there, on the dough, and it comes out just perfectly shaped. But that might not work with your family. Yes, yeah, someone might be doing a good job in a particular, some types of parenting that they're doing, but remember, that just says because you see it working doesn't mean it's going to help you. So try your best. You have to use your brain and make ask make dua ask Allah to help you and figure it out and apply what you can and try. Parenting is a task. It is not something that is passed by. You know a conveyor belt? Turn it on and it goes, it just moves by itself. That's not parenting. Parenting is you got to take each item across the belt by yourself. The conveyor belt doesn't work. Forget about it. It's not autopilot. Autopilot parenting. Nope, it's a job. And I hope I've got that across with this whole series. <laughs> okay. So that monkey see, monkey do in parenting does not work. It might work for someone else, but it might not work for you. So you have to be careful what you do. Some people, they're the way that they are that they parent their kids, they might be dominant. And that works for their children. But your children don't like dominance. Your children want you to be consultative, you want you to consult with them. And talk to them. You gotta apply that. You can't apply dominance because your kids will run away from you and put you in the old folks' home when you get older. We'll talk about that in a second. 
Our next concept of misconception in parenting is mini me children. You know mini me? What's a mini me? Come on, I'm using like Western uh, pop culture examples here. I'm trying to guess here. Mini me. What's a mini me? It's like a mini tiny me. Yeah. It's a reference to a movie that is really dumb anyway, a really dumb movie. But if you know it, then it clicks to you. The point is, many me children. Many me children means you want your children to be what you weren't. But not only do you want them to be what you weren't, you want them to be all of what you weren't. And guess what? It's not going to work. If you weren't good at math and you want your kids to be good at math, oh, you got to be the best in math. Yeah. Yo, yo, if your parents, your kids like math, fine. But you want to force them to be experts. Einstein. Yeah, it's not going to work. If you wanted to be a doctor your whole life, and you keep pushing your kid, be a doctor. No, you can't be an engineer. Be a doctor. No, no mechanics. No, I don't care if you like photography. You're going to be a doctor. It's not going to work. You can't live. Yani, you can't. Your child, your children's childhood is not your second chance at childhood. See what I'm saying? Your children's childhood is not your second chance at childhood. Let them be kids. Yani, let them be them. That's what I mean. Don't try to live through them a second chance. You say, mashallah, all my children are hafaz. I didn't do hafaz. You know, I didn't memorize Quran. But all of my kids, they're going to memorize Quran. That's excellent. But when you force them and they're not prepared to do it, that's a problem. Because some kids are not built. Not everybody's built. Hafaz is hard. Yani, memorizing Quran is not easy. And then think about it, that huge responsibility on their shoulders and they don't understand it. Think about it. When they misbehave, it's not like somebody else misbehaving. Right? So yes, have them memorize Quran, but memorize with them. And don't stress about them memorizing the whole thing. We have a whole culture. I've been in many communities. Parents take their kids out of school for two years. Memorize Quran. Right? Uh, memorize Quran. And this area, you get on top of them, memorize, 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 so you can finish in two years, so you can send them back to school, all because you want them to memorize Quran. Sometimes the kid is not built for it. You gotta be mindful of that. And that's what Quran becoming an engineer or a lawyer or a doctor or anything. Remember, many me children is not the proper way to parent your child. That's number two, I think. Yes, number two. Number three, that's the third. First one was inherited practices. Second one was monkey see, monkey do. And third one is many me children. Number four, there are only two parents. No one else can be a parent to your child. Not the school principal. Not the homeroom teacher, not the math teacher, not the imam at the masjid, not the youth mentor that you have, nothing. No one. Not the television. No one can be a parent to your child like you. You have to be parents. I have to be a parent to my child. You cannot substitute and delegate for people to take responsibility for me. No. You can't do that. That's wrong. You got the Sunday school parent, even. You no. Know? Where kids are learning so many awesome things from Sunday school, but their parents are doing none of that. Then what do you do? You're making your children a witness against you. Because they're learning all of this awesome, cool stuff about Islam, and they see you doing none of it, then they can recognize, my parents are not really good Muslims. That's, what the, that's, the, con that's the conclusion they're going to reach. Because all the awesome stuff I'm learning, my parents hardly pray. That's the reality. Now they're going to be stuck between two worlds. Confusion. So, there are only two parents. That's number four. Number five. Parent-child warfare. Guess what? You, the, the relationship between you and your child is not a war. It's not a war. Do not think that it's a war you're winning and beating them in battle and battle and battle. Absolutely not. You and your children are on the same team against Satan. Not you against your children. Guess what? If you keep trying to beat them on everything, beat them on every battle, and you want to be victorious champion over them, they will strike back at you with a vengeance. They will strike back at you with no mercy. They'll wait till you're really old, and all of the stuff that you used to do to them, they will do similar things to you, and you won't be able to do anything about it. Guess what? Instead, you have to win your children over, not defeat them. Win them over. Ha, with love, with dua, with ibadah, worshiping Allah together. Win them over. Become 
their heroes. Become what? Their heroes. Don't be their <coughs> conquerors. The sixth misconception is the big bad wolf. You know, huff and pluff, and you blow the house down. Where you're so tough, and you're bullying the house. Where you result to force all the time. And because you're big and strong, you overpower them. Yeah, that works while they're small. But when they become teenagers, you realize that they're a lot stronger than you are. Guess what? It won't work anymore. <laughs> It's a reality. So big bad wolf won't work, won't work. Don't be hustling and bustling and shouting over them. And don't do that. Because when you do that, they will repay the favor, as we said. Like the muscles in your arms. You can use them to squeeze someone really tight and make them feel really uncomfortable. Or you can use them to embrace someone very softly and make them feel comfortable. Same muscles. Different approach. Either you squeeze them and make them feel tight and uncomfortable or you make them embrace them. Take the embracing approach. Embrace them. Make them feel comfortable. Thank you very much. Another misconception is it works with your big sister. It worked with your big brother. They listen to me. Guess what? Each child is special. They're not the same. Some things work with this one and it don't work with that one. You have to realize that. They're like the strands on your beard. They don't go the same direction. Or the strands on your hair. They don't go the same direction. Yeah, that's why you got to comb it and keep making sure it goes the right way. But the reality is, many of those hairs go different ways. You have to give a different approach to those children. It's another misconception. <laughs> you ever seen Boss Baby? Yeah. You know Boss yeah, Baby? I watched the movie. You watch the movie? Uh, Boss Baby. That's a misconception that we should treat our kids like Adults. No, nope, not the very small kids. Don't treat them like adults. Boss baby, he's like an adult. He is a came there with a suit and everything. Remember? The kids, they know it. And that's why I use the references. They know the boss baby, he acts like an adult, right? But that's not how you treat your kids. Not like a boss baby, where he's an adult in a suit or, and so forth. So you have to treat them according to their age. Treat them as children. But to help them to mature, but not do not treat them as adults. That's another misconception of parenting. Because each stage comes with its own problems. Each stage of the child comes with its own problems. And you have to address those problems accordingly. The last misconception here is that, or I'll ask you a question. Can you purchase your children? No. Parents. Can you purchase the love of your children? No. Yes, he said yes. Keep giving me stuff, I will love you. Right? I know he doesn't mean it. You cannot purchase the love of your children. Your children need vitamin N. You know what vitamin N is? Vitamin no. They need a lot of vitamin no. Just for the sake of it. No. Why? Because no. Give them some no's. Yes, I know you guys don't like it very much, but it will help you, I promise you. Give them some no. Why you keep saying yes? Don't say yes all the time. Say no. They need it. Well, like that video game that they like, tell them no. Just say no. They say why? No. <laughs> you can tie it to homework. I don't, I don't mind. Say you don't get good grades. You want me to give you a video game? You don't read Quran. Something, yeah, you can tie it to something if you like, but tell them no sometimes. Because when they grow older, they want to get a yes for everything? Absolutely not. You're a parent, you're adults, you don't get yes for everything. Sometimes things don't work out. Your children have to learn that from an early age, that things might not work out like they planned or like they wanted. It's okay. And... Don't forget that we live in a society of consumerism where they're, learned, they're taught from a very young age, even if they watch YouTube now, the YouTube commercials come on. First YouTube had no commercials, now it's commercials. They put on the, the cartoon stuff or the baby stuff and they're watching it and these ads keep popping up. They can, you can't escape it. So that's the place you, they are oversaturated with buy, buy, purchase, purchase, buy, buy, purchase, purchase. You have to remember that. 
and you have to supplement that with a lot of no. No. Just no. And inshallah, you give them yes sometimes. Not give them yes all the time and sometimes say no. It's not going to work. You're going to develop spoiled children like that, that, that are feel entitled to things. And you should get it because you're my mom and dad. That's why you should get it. No. It's not reality. And that's why they become spoiled and they don't listen for the most part. Okay, we're going to quickly go over some myths of parenting. There are eight, and then we're going to take some time for Q&A. Number one myth is that parenting is always fun. Parents, is parenting always fun for you? Nope. Kids, you see that? Parenting is not always fun. It's hard work. Taking you and coming and dropping you at the swimming pool to get swimming lessons, and drop you at the basketball court to get basketball lessons, and drop you at football, and drop you at Quran. It's not fun. It's not fun. And paying your bills, and cleaning up behind you, and putting up with your back talking, your shouting, and your disrespect. That is not fun. It is difficult. There's a myth that parenting is fun, and it's not always fun. Second myth is that if you're good parents, you will have good children. Is that true? No. Yes. Nope. No, not really. If you're good parents, you might have good children. And if you're bad parents, you might have good children. Also. And if you're good, bad parents, you might have good children. I mean, you might have bad children, I meant to say. And if you're good parents, you still might have bad children. Guidance is up to who? Who guides? Allah. It's not up to you. You can be the best parent and have the worst children. So the concept that if you're good, you're going to automatically have good kids? No. You can try your best. But the reality is Allah will guide your children if He wants, He will guide mine if He wants, and He will misguide them if He wants. Number three. Yeah, saying, come here, Habib, right here. Where, how did you get there? Come, come here, please. Thank you. Appreciate it. Love you. Love you for Allah's sake, brother. You know that. Play it. Oh, one second. Number three. Children are appreciative by nature. That's a myth. That children just are appreciative. You think that you keep giving your child and your child is going to be appreciative of that? I bet you most of these kids that are, let's say, 10 and up, don't appreciate you for half of the things you've done. Because they're in that age that they don't understand. They will realize, yes, when they are about maybe 25 to 30 years old, they'll realize how intelligent you are. They'll realize how hardworking you, did, you are. They'll realize how awesome you are. But right now, about 10 and up, they don't realize that. You're in their way, you annoy them, they don't appreciate anything you do, that's just how it is. So to think that they're going to be appreciative just because you keep giving them, that's a myth. Forget about it. Most likely you keep giving them and they're not going to appreciate it. <laughs> My thing is, give them less. If they're not going to appreciate you giving them a lot, you might as well give them less and save a headache. You keep a couple dollars in your pocket, more, extra, and you know, and maybe teach them to survive off a of little. What love about it? Number four, another myth is that people think that parenting comes naturally. Does parenting come naturally? Don't think so. Parenting must be learned, just like driving a car, right? Just like putting on a shirt. You know, have, you know this button-up shirt you have? You know how, how many times you could probably remember that you misbutton it, and it's like this, and it's, this side is longer than that side? You had to learn how to properly button a shirt. Take your time and do it. You had to learn how to iron a a pair of pants. You have to learn how to be a parent. It doesn't come naturally. All of a sudden, you become a parent and you get this wahi or ilham, I should say, this revelation or this intuition that you know, nope, you have to learn it. And that's why kids are giving it to you now so you get some idea. You can refer back to it when you grow up and have kids. Number five. Another misconception is that family values are easy to teach the children, like respecting elders. Is that easy? Is it easy to teach your child to respect elders? Absolutely not. Especially when the only elders they know are you and your wife. Or you and your husband. As in the people at school that they see for, for eight hours that don't care much about them, they don't care much about how you expect them to respect elders. It's not easy. It's not easy to teach them to be patient. To teach them to be selfless. It's not easy. So whoever told you that it's easy to give them these Islamic values, they told you a myth. It is not easy. It's difficult. You have to work diligently just as I have to work diligently. Number six. Some people think that just common sense is enough to raise a, parent, a child. But that's not the case. Not common sense. 
You just when things come to you, you know, they say we we'll cross that bridge when we get there. If you wait till you get to teenage year to cross the bridge of teenage years, you're 10 years too late. And some of you recognize it. 10 years too late. If you wait to that moment, you must be preparing for that. And they're four years old, preparing them for teenage years or preparing yourself for when they return teenagers. It has to be some preparation. Number seven, you know, the self-destruct parent. What is the self-destruct parent? That is a parent that sacrificed all of themselves for the sake of their child. That's not what parenting is about. You can't forget yourself. You are your first priority. Parent, you are your first priority. Your akira comes first before your children's. Your, your children might not make it there. That's reality. And neither will might you might not make it there. But you have to be your first priority. Not destroying yourself on behalf of your child. Where you don't have a life except that you live through your children. Nope, absolutely not. You have to live your life. And then you, you know, help your children to live theirs. But do not spend all of your time on your children because that's not what Allah put you there for. He put you there to worship Him. He put you here to worship Him. And that means focus on yourself. And another which is related to that is that parents think that their top priority is their child. Everything their child this, their child that, their child this, their child that. Most parents I've noticed, even mothers, they forget about themselves on behalf of their children. They want to get the clothes from their children. They want to get the food for their children. And they forgot to put their food on the list. And they forgot to put the, their clothes on the list. They want to get this and that for the children. They forgot to put their, uh, uh, we call toiletries, toothpaste and things like that on the list for themselves. That's not, your first priority is not your child. Your first priority is your Rabb, your Lord, and your responsibility to Him, yourself. And then the children, don't forget that. If you want to review this material, it's all available. It's being recorded, so please review it. It's a lot of information, but please take it as a lesson to be learned. Yes, ma'am. Our sister said that she has a few children at home. She has an elder child at home. And she realized that through teaching the eldest child or through raising the eldest child, that if you do not focus on yourself and make time for yourself, then your children won't make time for themselves. You have to have some me time. Even if it's 30 minutes before Maghrib on Jumu'ah. 30 minutes before Maghrib on Jumu'ah. Why do I mention Jumu'ah? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that there is a time frame in Jumu'ah that Allah will answer all du'as in that time. And most scholars say that it's the last hour between Asr and Maghrib. Come to the masjid, spend that time, make du'a. Spend some your knee time. Even if it's just that. There should be more than that, by the way. But if nothing else, come to the masjid or in your car or somewhere and make du'a 30 minutes, last 30 minutes. That way you get that sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned and it's most likely to be answered. Uh, for you guys, you guys notice that most of your parents are nocturnal. That means they're up at night and sleeping and they work in the daytime. Maybe they're up at night. Because when you go to sleep, then they can be themselves. I don't know if you noticed that. When you go to sleep, then they can live. They can like relax. But as long as you're up, they're worried about you. Remember that. Parents, I know it's difficult, but spend that time on yourself. May Allah make it easy for you. Yes, any other questions or concerns or comments? Yes, sir. Yes. What match action did he take? Aqub to correct his children. And that's, you have to read Surah Yusuf for that. That's the point. When you read Surah Yusuf, you see at the end how he let it play out. And he kept his faith in Allah. He let the whole story play out. Because he knew it was beyond himself. But he did what he could. And he put his trust in Allah. He did what he could. He didn't just say sit back. No, he did what he could. But he realized he was limited. And he let the story play out. And it played out to his benefit. Yaqub's benefit because all of his children made tawbah and Allah chose his son to be a minister of I don't know what you would call it basically he was the minister of the reservoirs I mean the storages storage units of food and that's a high place and then they all migrated to Egypt and so forth and that's where those tribes lived or those boys lived and they developed into tribes and then Moses came to deliver them from there from Pharaoh to further so Allah had a whole plan behind it of course but when you read the rest of Surah Yusuf, you see how he 
dealt with it. Extremely patient, extremely patient. Right. Right. You'll see it as you. Right. Of course, definitely they made a huge mistake, and they realized that at the end. But if you see how he was dealing with the whole situation, when he even sent them back to Egypt, and he said, "Go back to Egypt and be on alert for your brother, for you, Joseph, and your brother." So he told them at that point that basically at that point he told them that I, I know he's not dead. Keep an eye out for Joseph. You might find him there in Egypt. You see? And he let it play out. He was extremely patient. And he, so you see how he, he let it play out? It's beautiful. Yes, Mr. Hamid. I mean, you might clarify this more. It's not about the use of the sources. But of course, just to know, inshallah, first, that the brothers of Yusuf, because they were most careful. Those are also the were good kids. But they did something wrong, and that's what the Shaykh said that they, uh, that, uh, they made Toba to Allah. Allah accepted their Toba, just to tell you about their heart. Yeah. So, one thing also to know uh, we, the parents, we commit this a lot. I mean, this is not the same way I all committed this, but we are uh, to blame about this. Usually, especially the youngest of our kids, the last one. We take more care of it just because he's the little one, a girl or a boy. But then his other siblings, we have to pay attention, especially those who are like one year or two years older. They start feeling a lot of jealousy and bouncing because we don't do this out of because we love that one more than the others. But we are to be, uh, you know, uh, very careful about that one because we create that issue of jealousy in the in the brothers, in the siblings, and they start hating each other. You will not realize that sometimes they may hurt themselves, but at one point they can realize that that we have to be careful with that one as well. Yes, we have to be really careful on the emotional state of our children because we're in a society where you can cut yourself and it's cool. It's a fact. Kids are cutting themselves, harming themselves. People are suicidal. Kids are suicidal. Can you believe it? That kids are c c contemplating in schools to commit suicide. And it's a thing. You know what a thing is? It's a fad. <clears throat> you know how crazy that is? You didn't have to deal with that when you were children. See? So, honey, ooh, honey, man, we have a lot of work to do, especially on this side of the planet, on this side of the world. We have a lot more work to do than people back home. And once we realize that, and we turn these communities and ours into, to, of ours into families, and work hard together to raise these kids, we'll be able to reach our full potential. So that's what these lectures are for. Any more questions? Adults, please, especially adults. I give the kids a lot of uh, time here. Adults, questions, comments? So I hope that you all have uh, been reminded of many things here. I hope that you have some more insight. I hope that some light bulbs went off in your head. I hope that you become uh, more curious about next week's lecture, which will be the final one in this series. And I hope that you become more curious about Islamic education in general, especially parenting in this regard, to learn what it is necessary for you to be a better parent and more effective parent to leave a legacy behind, right? Because as you are being a more effective parent, the legacy stands, and then your children will be effective, their children will be effective, and inshallah, Islam will remain as an identity, even if as a minority, even if that's the case, but it will remain as a strong identity wherever it is. Anything that I said that is correct, then it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and we appreciate Him for that one and only. Anything that I've said that is incorrect, I apologize for that. That is from me and Satan. May Allah forgive us for our sins. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Nabiya Muhammad. Jazakum Allah khayyam.